So yeah, I'm very happy to to be in this uh, talk and awesome. present Thank to you. you really. intro. And uh, yeah, I I, I can uh, that, that that's a very typical ADHD person eclectic CV, and I can make a bit more fun of it as I continue with introducing this topic. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of very diverse things. Uh, as Ross pointed out, I'm a, a founder and I've been uh, dealing with ecosystem development for a long time. Uh, I've been quite, even though I first raised some funding to build down related tech in 2015, I moved out of the space until about a year ago. And then I got back into DAOs, um, well, into real DAOs, because now they are actual people that do stuff uh, via DAOs, mm. which is a massive culture shock for me. And from one point of view, and from another point of view, uh, this was not long ago after I got my ADHD diagnosis, which uh, to me came as absolutely no surprise because that's something just based on popular culture that I expected I had, but it also made me kind of get a bit more educated on the topic and understand what ADHD actually is, which was quite shocking once I, I learned about it. So um, yeah, that has been quite a journey and I'll, I'll, there were a few stories uh, that come out of it, but also, well, one, one to my bewilderment, uh, there was tons of people that were neurodivergent in the house. Uh, and for some reason, we seem to congregate in this environment. And I'm quite puzzled why that is. And intuitively, it kind of makes sense. But then when I actually start to try to reason about it, uh, the, the reasons might not be that obvious, right? And um, since since this has been a topic uh, that's been very, very important for me now for a while, and I've been trying to do a bit of advocacy work and engaging with different charities and so on, and um, I did a talk uh, about two weeks ago on the topic in front of 150 people at an event, um, which is an amazing event, right? But uh, in a very typical ADHD way, I, I never really prepared for that. I never made slides. I just showed up and improvised. And it was, um, people uh, People really liked it. And I felt like, okay, we, 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 the, the, there were a few insights that were not obvious to people as they were not to me. So I, I wanted to do this talk here. Uh, but again, I didn't prepare. So um, as a typical ADHD person, you can do that together with me. Uh, and what, what I've done is I've set up a my board to, and I, I'll, I'll share a link. And I'm hoping we can make a couple of interactive uh, interactions on the back of it. Can I pin this link? No, not here, but I'll, I'll share it again if need be. And I will also share my screen. And I'd love it if you guys help me debunk why do neurodivergent people gather around DAOs and how can we make DAOs more uh, workable and a, a kind of inclusive for neurodivergent people? Because in many ways, uh, this has been a lot of fun and great. And in many ways, it's been beyond dysfunctional. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Ross, I think you might have not given me rights to share the screen. And this is why, why we are, I'm, I'm having a menu in Greek, uh, moment here where I'm trying to click on things, but I'm doing a random other stuff because I actually don't have the button. I'm a co-host. Cool. Uh, nice. Let's share screen, share screen. There we go. Oof. ADG is something that, um, a lot of people have apparently, and there's been a lot of talk that there's a bit of a, an epidemic in recent years where more and more people identify as neurodivergent uh, in different ways. And there are many different types of neurodivergence and ADHD is just one of them. Um, well, what's typical for people that uh, have this syndrome is that uh, they tend to struggle to focus, are often late, speak too fast, like me. So if I speak too fast and you can't understand, make some gesture or interrupt me somehow. Uh, normally, we have a rule where you throw stuff at me, but uh, that's physically not so easy at the moment. Um, and uh, they often have trouble sleeping, uh, fidget a lot, tend to have weird motor functions and move in certain ways, uh, and uh, tend to uh, be quite impulsive and hyperactive sometimes. Uh, so, so that's the spectrum of symptoms that uh, a lot of people have uh, experienced. And especially nowadays with social media and um, and a lot of like, kind of addiction to stimulation that we've developed through all kinds of systems we interact with. 
uh, we've become yet more, ever more distracted and unable to focus around whatever we're doing at the moment. So that, that's kind of what's feeding into the narrative that ADHD is something that we're creating through behavior or through physiological factors. And it's uh, largely our choice and we just need to work harder, focus harder, have be a better character and so on. And that is partially true. Right. I mean, not, not the character part, but just the, the environment at the moment has been creating an epidemic of these symptoms. And as I explain what ADHD is fun, uh, fundamentally, I think you will go, gonna be able to appreciate why that is happening as a result of social media. Um, but at the same time, uh, medicine is uh, quite, uh, and science is quite categorical, that that's not the full story. Um, and in fact, it's a syndrome that under different names has been studied for probably close to 200 years now with very, very detailed clinical history. Uh, and mm, not runaway ADHD symptom type thing, very typical, right? And uh, it's one of the few occasions where this behavior is actually helpful because it's helping uh, illustrate what we're talking about in the world. Um, Right, so uh, beyond the, the environmental factors, there seems to be a case where, where a condition where certain parts of the population have a much more fundamental uh, version of these, uh, of these symptoms, which is a newer developmental disorder, uh, which can only develop up to age four while your brain is forming. Uh, and uh, or before you're born while still you're still in the fetus, right? And after that, uh, if you develop versions of these symptoms that is more physiologically uh, induced, that can be managed in very different ways than if you have like a neurological change in the development of your brain. So, so that's a very important distinction to keep in mind. And a lot of these things in popular media get conflated at the moment, but they are really not the same thing. And the, the thing I, I wanted to say, and I almost forgot to say, and that just came back to me, is that I wanted to put the disclaimer that I'm not uh, a doctor, I'm not a researcher in these fields, and I'm not really qualified to speak to a lot of the topics we want to touch on today. Um, to put some level of uh, credibility, because there's a, a tremendous amount of debate uh, around these topics at the moment in, in academia and in uh, popular culture and in uh, politics, like uh, a few months ago, there was uh, a series of uh, cabinet sessions of the UK government dedicated particularly to the topic of ADHD because, because it's kind of impacting society significantly. A lot of psychiatrists believe that this is by far the most severe and at the same time most common psychiatric uh, condition that's uh, treated with outpatient care, right? I mean, uh, for things like schizophrenia, you just generally get hospitalized. And anything under that, this tends to be one of the most severe things uh, that, that can impact uh, the general population, right? Uh, so, so, so it's a topic of public interest. Um, yet I'm going to touch on a few of these topics. And the way I'm, I'm going to connect it is I'm, I'm going to follow broadly the structure of a book I read, uh, which is called Scattered Minds, by an author called... Um, Gabo Mate, uh, who is um, an academic from Harvard, was born in Hungary uh, during the Second World War under some fairly difficult conditions, and he's, he's a bit of a thought leader on this topic. But um, I have read other academic papers on the topic. I've uh, looked in other research, uh, and, and I will, I'll probably ignore some of the controversy around uh, uh, around aspects of this and focus on what what's kind of uh, embedded in the in the academic work of this particular researcher. Um, right. So so let's get right into it. Uh, Twenty one minutes into the call, right? I mean, uh, and I'll talk about time blindness uh, in a moment. Uh, well, one of the most important things I, I want to challenge here is: should we is ADG actually a good name? It's uh, ADG means attention deficit hyperfocus disorder and it has its rootings in how this uh, condition has been observed that's been mostly in children 
who are very difficult to deal with in a classroom, uh, especially post the industrial revolution when we had kind of industrialized education in classrooms in a particular way. There are certain children, mainly boys, who are very disruptive and they got studied and treated. Um, that historically has led to some level of uh, uh, kind of not sufficient diagnosis in uh, girls uh, at young age because the way uh, this manifests in uh, women and men tends to be somewhat different. And, um, and there's been a bit of a gender gap because uh, girls tend to not to be that disruptive as boys, so they, they weren't given as much attention. They tend to flip in adulthood where for a number of reasons uh, adult men who didn't get diagnosed as children uh, almost never get diagnosed where adult women tend to be diagnosed a lot more so so you have the opposite problem in adults in terms of how the diagnostic effort is uh, is organized which, which are both uh, i mean uh, things that need to be addressed um and and well the, how diagnostics works is part of a whole discussion around the diagnostic statistical manual of psychiatric conditions and now we are dsm5 Given the time, I, I don't want to dig into that, but I just want to flag that there's a whole interesting discussion about uh, how we do diagnostics and why and what the biases that have emerged because of that. And that there's a discussion of whether ADHD shouldn't be called an executive, executive function disorder rather than ADHD. And uh, the executive function is, is kind of a specific uh, function of the brain that allows you to focus uh, choose what to do and what not to do and follow uh, a series of actions in, in a predetermined con con um, consequence or something like that. And, and we can talk about this more. It, it's a fundamental concept, but it's a very, very fundamental concept, uh, function of your brain that gets disrupted. And this has multidimensional implications, one of which is that you become fidgety at times and struggle to focus, but it's a lot more fundamental than that. So... Uh, uh, we, we can go, now, now we have a choice. We can go to the neurological basis of where uh, this comes from, or we can go to the types of manifestation. Um, I, I think we can cover this quite rapidly. Um, in terms of manifestation, uh, I thought, uh, thought uh, mentioned inattentiveness and hyperactivity. They tend to be two different types of manifestations that appear in different people, more so than the other one. And uh, and some of them have mixed spectrum of, of both of these things. That that is a, one of the classifications that's being used. They they are more, but but some of the more um, kind of socially recognizable terms that exist around uh, these community of people are things like delayed sleep syndrome, uh, which which is related to are you struggling to wake up until later in the day and then struggling to fall asleep later on. This relates to dopamine and emotional dysregulation, uh, something we call wait, waiting mode, uh, where if you have something else to do later that occupies your brain, you can't really effectively fill the time before it with something else because your you, executive function can't redirect the, 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 the focus. And uh, things like time blindness, where you generally people with ADHD have reduced ability to tell the passage of time, like uh, neurotypical people. And there's probably 10 more concepts like that that, uh, that are associated. Um, in terms of uh, the origin of uh, the, where ADG comes from, uh, as I mentioned, there's a physiological aspect to it where if you eat bad food, don't exercise, drink, snort cocaine, watch porn all the time, uh, play stupid amounts of video games or uh, watch social media, uh, all of these things uh, produce, reward, kind of play with the reward mechanisms of the brain, which is related to dopamine. Get, that gets really disrupted. And then you can uh, essentially exhibit all the symptoms of somebody who has uh, ADHD just based on these physiological factors. But you can also recover from that fairly predictably, right? Um, with, with people that, that have this in neurodevelopmental syndrome, um, they, they need, there's um, a series of additional uh, factors which we, we can break into a genetic predisposition and then this leads to uh, neurotransmit effects on neurotransmitter systems, brain structure, and brain connectivity. And that tends to be more a consequence of the other things rather than uh, that, that's something that I think is uh, proven to be that genetic. So uh, ADG in particular tends to be, uh, has a heredity factor of about 70 to 80%. So it's highly um, 
inheritable. Um, however, uh, the fact that you have those genes don't necessarily determine uh, uh, an increase of the probability that you would have. Uh, well, you can kind of have ADG only if you have these genes, but having them doesn't mean you have it, right? I mean, then, then you need environmental factors to, to come into play. If you just have those genes, um, and, and here are a couple of them that uh, are well tracked and known, but they are the ones that play a, a role into this whole equation. These tend to be related with dopamine production, but generally speaking, people that have the genetic makeup of uh, somebody who can have ADHD tend to be uh, with uh, increased sensitivity of the neural system. So that would mean that you have more empathy, uh, you see better in the dark, um, you tend to uh, kind of get over stimulated easily with smells and tastes and stuff like that. So kids with ADHD would often walk in the kitchen when somebody is uh, cooking and then uh, vomit or get sensory overloaded by noise from other kids and just can't stay in the group with other kids. So um, the people that tend to have um, these genes, they often end up with artistic inclinations as well, right? So that, that's kind of the makeup. So by themselves, I, I don't think this is something that's an undesirable trait fundamentally. And that there's also a lot of uh, debate whether uh, ADHD should be considered um, uh, a disorder and a disability because at certain times of human evolution, those traits would have been incredibly helpful, right? Around things like hunter-gatherer behavior. Uh, which is not so common in the post-agricultural uh, uh, age of humanity, where we, we kind of, in post-industrial revolution, we value systematic behavior rather than uh, responsive behavior in, 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 uh, in that sense. So that is the debate as well. I'm, I'm not going to take an opinion on it. I'm just going to mark it for the purposes of this call. Uh, but what generally happens if uh, one has those genes, uh, and that same person gets exposed to excessive levels of stress or their mother gets exposed to excessive levels of stress when uh, when, when uh, they're pregnant with the said person and they have very high levels of cortisol as a result. Um, there seems to be an, some kind of a event that happens that triggers the onset of ADG, ADG, which becomes a change in the way the brain forms, right? And you, you can even very very predictably track some of these things in uh, well, in, in data where um, just mothers who have lost a first degree relative, like their parent dies or their sister dies or their child dies or something like that while they're pregnant, uh, that increases the, in the data sets. And, and this is very easy to track over large populations because there's demographic data, right? I mean, you can just take a data set and not even know the people and, and just look at that. I, be, I believe, that don't, don't uh, quote me on this because I, I haven't looked at it before this talk, but I believe one of the papers found the increase in the probability of ADHD in the kid by 13 times, right? I mean, or something ridiculous like that. It sounds too much now that they say it, but it was really, really... Um, high high signal, right? Um, and and that kind of tells you a bit about how does this develop. Um, it, it tends to be associated with experiences where you can't really solve them through fight or flight, uh, flight, uh, fight or flight, and uh, kids dissociate heavily, and that that impacts the the development of the brain, which kind of generally hits these systems. Uh, most importantly, the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, part of the brain uh, in the front of your brain, uh, which um, um, it, it's essentially where executive function lives, right? I mean, your ability uh, as, a, as a developed mammal and even a human, right, which is self-aware to choose, I'm going to do this and not do this and, and have that level of choice is essentially executive function and that is structured in the prefrontal context uh, cortex and has been shown to have a lower lower volume in many people with ADG, right uh, additionally uh, the basal ganglia gets impacted um, and uh, that, that has to do with regulating uh, motor control functions um, so that's not to say uh, that people with ADHD can't be, I don't know, athletes or acrobats or something like that. In fact, history knows plenty of examples of that, but something in the way these develop changes. 
and it tends to produce a bunch of uh, very very particular very peculiar implications. Which uh, well, when I was reading the literature, it, it just felt so particular and weird. Like for example, people with ADHD, they can't even when their kids they can't touch their toes. Uh, because uh, the the, um, the glutes uh, on the back of the the legs tend to tighten, uh, so so they you have less mobility in them, or, or they have to ha tend to have like a, a shape of the neck that's uh, pointing forward a little bit, because of some kind of um, tension in certain muscle groups, and uh, also kind of very particular motions where you're trying to go through the door and you slightly hit uh, the edge and so on, but at the same time under different circumstances, I don't know, you're dancing ballet, you do it perfectly, right? So there seems to be some uh, some kind of very particular issue there. Um, and uh, that's the basal ganglia is the part which tends to be associated specifically with very heightened impulsive uh, behavior and hyperactivity, uh, which is also uh, very typical with people with ADG. They, they tend to have uh, much higher levels of addiction uh, four times the suicide rate than the general population, uh, which is kind of part of what informs the general five years lower uh, life expectancy by the general population, a bunch of other not very fun things like that, right? Um, beyond that, uh, there's the cerebellum, uh, which also has an association to motor control and uh, has an important uh, aspect related to cognitive functions. Mm. I, I, to, to be honest, I'm not super well educated on some of these topics. I've read about them. I, I don't feel prepared to fully make the case, but uh, so something has been tracked is that in, in the data, and this is more pronounced than the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, the cerebellum of people with ADHD tends to have uh, significant reduction in volume. Uh, not, not with everybody, but maybe with 60% of people with ADHD. Um, uh, and then there's the corpus uh, uh, callosum, if I'm pronouncing this correctly. I never knew how to pronounce this thing when I read it, to be honest. But uh, sorry, I'm I'm, uh, I'm kind of doing something weird here. Uh, this is kind of the part of the brain that ties together your, your two hemispheres. And that seems to not work exactly as uh, with the general populations or with neurotypicals. Uh, and uh, that, that's kind of, again, related to motor functions. And uh, it, it has to do maybe with connecting cognitive with uh, motor functions, right? So it, it, only under specific circumstances, you're able to, to, to kind of exhibit that level of control you're doing while doing ballet. But then when you get distracted, you become incredibly clumsy, right? So it's, uh, it's something like that. I mean, and again, that's uh, just a very uh, superficial interpretation. Um, more understandable, I think, for more people, for most people. The, the main point I was trying to wrap up here is that this seems to not be just physiological or uh, on a neurotransmitter level. This seems to have to do with the structure of the brain. And I think that goes further to neuroconnectivity, which, which I'll, I'll get in a, in a moment. Uh, but from a neurotransmitter point of view, there are three main ones that get affected. And the first one is dopamine. I imagine most people I imagine most people don't know too much about these brain structures and most people have heard those neurotransmitters from just popular culture right and still I'll, I'll do a super brief uh, explanation of what the, they are um dopamine is basically uh the thing that gives you a reward when you do something that evolution thought is good for you like you eat sugar sugar is rare it doesn't exist in nature you found an apple you ate an apple and you're happy you you get a reward you have sex, you get a reward, right? I mean, this, this is how dopamine works. Um, you, you increase your status in a group of people, super important, you get dopamine, right? Um, the, the, the ultimate example is if any of you uh, have ever tried, uh, for example, um, cocaine, um, and that, that's kind of quite well studied in the literature as well. Uh, well, what this does is it increases uh, your dopamine levels uh, to about 150% above norm. And then it just collapses until you do it again. And then it creates this kind of oscillation, which, which is very unhealthy. Uh, but for a while, while you're doing it, you feel very powerful, strong, confident, dominant as well, right? Um, people with ADHD tend to have very low levels of dopamine. 
uh, because of genetic predispositions and, and kind of the development of these neurological issues, which means that it's incredibly hard for them to, or for us to start doing a task, right? In order for you to start doing a task, you need to say, okay, there's a task. Generally, if you solve a math problem, that gives you a reward, right? I mean, or if you get the punchline of a joke, or if you do your taxes, at the end, you, you get a certain level of a reward, like this is how your brain works. But then you need to have enough of this kind of resource in order to start in the first place. And, and people with ADHD don't have it, so it's impossible to start tasks. Um, and I can talk about the dopamine management for a long time, but uh, it, it, it's uh, challenging. Um, yeah, Rosa? And how do you start the task if you don't have this? Because I also have a difficulty starting tasks, right? Yeah. I so don't so know if, if it's different. The, the, that's a great question. And, and uh, people with ADHD tend to develop a profound set of strategies, which is not too, too different to the strategies uh, neurotypical people develop, but they tend to be significantly more pronounced, right? The, the way a psychiatrist explained this to me is that like, and this has to do with all these things where, like, isn't that a thing for everybody? Like, isn't it hard for everybody to just go and do their taxes? I mean, yes, absolutely, it is. Um, but uh, the way the psychiatrist put it is sometimes you go and pee maybe two, three times a day. In some days, maybe you go eight times, right? For whatever reason, you drank a lot of water, you, I, 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 I don't know, you peed eight times that day, right? And there's a variance, which is kind of typical. Uh, by that measure, people with ADHD would pee every day 70 times, regardless if, if they drink water. So, so that's kind of the, the distinction of the level of uh, self-pressure you need to put on yourself in order to start on that task. Uh, and uh, and that, that's incredibly debilitating, right? I mean, in, in the UK, that's considered a disability. You, you get certain, it, it's a very minor kind of class of disability. But like, for example, living in the UK, where, where this class is disability, I get to expense, I think, 400 pounds a year for missing the train because it's known that I can't be expected to get the, on time for the train as a normal person, right? No, no, no let's not use the word normal person, but it, it's just, it's uh, medically proven to be dead significant. Um, and uh, and residents on the call here who has to chase me every month uh, to, to fulfill, to do an admin task for our endow, uh, where, where we kind of do this coordinate uh, business. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it's I, 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 the kind of part of what's good about getting diagnosed with these things is that all the guilt for, guilt for not doing it disappears completely <laughs> because you just appreciate how much harder that is than, to do than for a neurotypical person, right? Under normal conditions. Let, let, let's go to the next one uh, for a moment. I mean, uh, well, actually, I didn't ask any, um, a Ross question. The, the answer is you develop a shit ton of strategies where you build internal narratives in your brain where things would catastrophic things would happen if you don't do it uh and uh you yeah catastroph catastrophize i hate yourself uh and, and it just it's a very painful process or you you just generally find an artificial way to create a crisis to force you to do it right and uh, people like that they tend to be brilliant in crisis because they're kind of operating in a self-induced crisis all the time. When the real crisis happens, then all of a sudden it becomes easy. And, and that's, uh, that's something that only made sense after diagnosis because I remember times where I was really, really struggling with work. And then unfortunately, somebody in the team died and all of a sudden everything became easy for me uh, while everybody was in mourning, right? And I said, what the hell is wrong with me? I mean, and then you end up with these really complicated narratives, but similar to... Kind of situations like, like caffeine, for example, caffeine tends to relax people with ADHD because it just uh, restores your level to normal, levels to normal. And the medication uh, around ADHD is essentially, um, it's like cocaine. I, I, I forgot the, the name of uh, the, the drug category, but it's just very slow release cocaine that increases your dom dopamine levels artificially. And then you start feeling like a neurotypical person where if somebody else takes, um, other role, they go in hyper mode, right? And with that, you just don't feel it, right? And it is the same response to cocaine. Uh, not cocaine, caffeine, I mean. Um, I, I don't have experience with cocaine to, to be able to speak from, from personal experience. But um, yeah, um, that's, uh, and, and kind of the smart way to do it is just you get a nice cold shower in the morning that um, gives you the exact same amount of uh, dopamine boost as a line of coke. 
which many people don't know. It just it does this really slow release. So if you do a three, four minute ice cold shower in the morning, you're kind of sorted. But um, doing that and a few other things that you need to deal with, incredibly fidgety if you have uh, that sort of disorder, like the smallest deviation of you not sleeping as well as you normally do, and then the whole day turns into a catastrophe, right? The other thing that's super important, and I, I just want to jump on that and skip ahead, uh, because serotonin uh, is kind of, lack of serotonin is what makes you depressed. Um, a lot of people understand that, uh, but uh, that doesn't really get very affected uh, in most cases from ADHD. So, so it's not an important thing to focus on. It, it, there is no clinical evidence that it does get affected. Um, and then the, the, the other really, really important one that I, uh, that I think people miss when they think about dopamine is the norepinephrine, which is kind of basically adrenaline, uh, in, in said in a different way, or noradrenaline or uh, whatever you have it. Uh, and that's kind of what happens if somebody slaps you in the face. And I hope not everybody has that experience. And I'm sure at least the boys in the room have had it in kindergarten, uh, but when somebody slaps you in the face, uh, well, what happens is you become agitated and then you get tunnel vision, right? And then you see that thing in your laser focus, right? So um, what norepinephrine does is that it allows you to, it allows your brain, brain to selectively suppress the function of parts of it. So for example, if you focus at reading, you stop hearing as well, right? And people that are good at focus, like they can start reading and they can filter out what's happening around them uh, and focus, right? And this is done through this neurotransmitter. Uh, people uh, that uh, naturally everybody has a different degree of ability to do that. People with ADHD have almost no ability to do that. So you're constantly tuned in into everything all the time uh, and you can't stop it, right? And that's why kind of sometimes you burn out and uh, more easily and you get more agitated easily because um, you don't have the mechanism that allows you to focus on one thing at the expense of another. Uh, and, and that kind of also creates a little bit of this hyper-connectivity of the ADHD brain, which uh, I, I've kind of put a category for perks here. And, and there are some, yeah, if we're honest. Like uh, ADHD people tend to think very well at breadth because they are never focused and everything's always connected to everything. So you, you kind of instantly, people speak and you spot all the patterns, especially if you can move superficially and very fast. Uh, and that's why, um, yeah, there was something to that and, uh, around increased brain connectivity, but th I think that's one of the reasons we like DAOs. Uh, but anyway, I mean, this, this also doesn't work and this is also part of the ADHD medication. It's a mix of these two things, essentially. Uh, and, uh, the one thing that's really, really important to stress out is that, uh, while ADHD is a neurodevelopmental, uh, disorder, it is not a learning disability. So there's absolutely zero evidence to suggest that ADHD in any way reduces your, uh, IQ or it reduces your neuroplasticity, right? So ADHD people are able to learn at least as, even, even the opposite. I think just uh, there are a lot of uh, kind of people that just statistically end up with a very high IQ that also end up neurodivergent and they tend to become very big overachievers and they, they cluster and that creates this myth that uh, these sort of neurodivergence things also make you smarter. Unfortunately, that's not the case. It's just that once you're smarter and that's exactly the same distribution of IQ than the general population, once you're smarter, having this disability also develops some things that can turn into a little bit superpowers and then they get anecdotally overexposed. And that, that's kind of, again, my interpretation of the whole thing. Um, and, and the bit about brain maturation is, again, it matures in all other ways, exactly with, with, with these exceptions that were noted as uh, any normal brain, uh, but tends to be slowed down sometimes by two, three years. Uh, like in terms of how it develops over age, and uh, it still reaches kind of similar levels. That that's again uh, an oversimplification, but it's one way to think about it. Uh, we we covered everything here. The the final bit I want to touch on is comorbidities. Most people with ADHD find it uh, discover it after they've been treated for anxiety and depression for years, which uh, is a mistake. 
you often do develop anxiety or depression, but that's as a result of mismanaging ADHD. Otherwise, there's no, yeah, that, that, that's kind of something that's more common, more understood, and people get treated. There's something called ODD, which is uh, kind of you don't like people telling you what to do, and you get pathologically opposed to it. Uh, so there's a whole interesting conflict there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I kind of what I'm hoping we do in the remaining 10, 15 minutes of this call is to, to think about uh, if there are people in the room here that um, that have similar experience in their life, um, to think about what are some of the perks they, they think they've gotten on the back of uh, having ADHD. And I, I think there are many, like I mentioned, the uh, the brain connectivity, the hyper-focus, because when you get hyper-focus, you can stay focused for like 20 hours and not sleep and do a week of work. Uh, you, you get this very rapid association and kind of super quick, like you know what people are going to say after the second word of their sentence very often. Um, you, you become good hunter-gatherer. If there's a, a kind of a resource um, acquisition situation, like you're playing a game or you're in the markets trying to sell something, you you... So some of these things kind of put you in a good category of the population, I, I believe. Uh, yeah, and you pick all kinds of cool random skills along the way because you just can't focus or you, you do everything all the time. So you have a bajillion hobbies and they, yeah, you might put those people on Wikipedia around you all the time because you know a little bit about everything and yeah, you know random shit. This morning in the in social media, there's a whole meme verse of those things, but Kind of a, what, what, what I was curious to see is uh, if you guys feel like it, can you take a bunch of post-it notes and just, uh, first of all, comment on anything you'd like uh, on the board. Uh, and uh, take a bunch of post-it notes and uh, you just put them here uh, and uh, think about what do you think DAOs what makes DAO so attractive to people with uh, different, you don't need to limit it just to neurodivergence, but to ADHD, to any neurodivergence, so that there are so many of us. It's just that nobody else wants us and we, we kind of escape into uh, the swamp. Or is it that uh, actually by reorganizing the future of work in DAOs, we can not only benefit from some of the promises that we have in that space, but kind of make it a better world for the more diverse group of people. Where if we take this into any sort of reasonable projection, probably 60% of people, like a lot of research is done in America. I, I don't know if America is different than any other part of the world in that sense, but about 60% of all Americans probably uh, have some form of neurodivergence. While each of them is a very, little represented, like ADHD is maybe up to 4%, but the population is huge, most of them under 1%. In combination, everybody is a little bit neurodivergent. And I, I'm a strong believer that we need to find places that are not necessarily inclusive in the sense that they're tolerant, but rather they leverage the strengths that come out with all of these uh, kind of conditions. And I think they are some. So, so that's why I've kind of grouped perks with uh, how about in DAOs. And I'm gonna give you a timer. It, it kind of uh, is everybody on the device where you keen to do something like that. Give me thumbs up and down. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of looking at uh, Duke uh, rejoice. Uh, rather, Mercurio is saying yes, which is good. And Jack, and Matt Collins, and Milena. So we have six people. Or it's a small enough group, so if you just feel to unmute and say stuff, and I'll put it on the board. And I can explain some of the concepts. Could be bold. Sorry, Lino. Yeah? Can you explain one more time uh, what we're supposed to put in those uh, sticky notes? Yeah, so so uh, the question is, uh, what about DAOs is really good for people that have these disorders, and what about DAOs is really bad? And uh, and I'm I'm trying to map these two two, two ideas out. And thank you for uh, for asking me to make this more clear. This ties into um, info dumping. There's something called info dumping where you can't selectively just say some things. You 
start you want to say one thing and you say everything that's associated with it and you it's, it's impossibly difficult yeah and i do that a lot for also no just <laughs> difficult to to follow my line of thought hmm. In flexibility of work, oh, that's a great one. Yeah, so uh, these sort of people like us, we tend to operate on bursts of energy, right? So some people like, they like to have a routine, start at one time, end at one time, and just follow uh, some, some normal order. Uh, I have found this completely impossible. Like I, I've never been able to work in a job which has a working hours kind of window. I, I've had contracts like this, I just didn't follow them. I, I've been absolutely unable to do that at school. Uh, and DAOs let you just plug in and out whenever you want. Uh, and yeah, then, then you get to choose the order and what, what you work on so because self-organizing, so you can follow the dopamine, which is huge, huge, yeah. Uh, and usually whatever's the biggest crisis gives you the most dopamine anyway. And DAOs are so disorganized that there's always crisis. So that that's a, a good environment. Yeah. And I'm taking saying this absolutely seriously, by the way, that there's no joke about it at the moment. It, it's just generally like I, I've tried working with teams that are super organized and structured, and I, I it's hell. But put me in a crisis, it's fun. Mm. You have very high crisis tolerance when you have ADG, as long as you can do this huge spikes of work and then you have full emotion release which is something that actually in my experience working in Dow has been almost impossible to manage because the te like teams generally perform really well like uh, on energy levels like this ADG people perform on energy levels like this and uh, the problem with DAOs in Web3 is that uh, always somewhere somewhere is awake and they're working and they're pinging you and kind of getting this constant simulation is amazing. And then you plug in like in the matrix, then at some point you're, you feel completely spent and you plug out and this is the exact time you relax. But at some point you need to plug out for longer and that moment never exists, right? And then you burn out and then it becomes this trickling down thing, which I, I have to admit I experienced a little bit in May. The, the, like last month where I just really, really wanted to plug out. And then over three weeks, this became impossible. So I, I, I just defaulted a little bit. Uh, Sorry, was this was this because of the DAO or was this because in, in, in maybe you had a startup, for example, and you needed to work on something for three weeks? Yeah, so, so generally with startups, even when I was fundraising, uh, we, we, which is the hardest bit, um, you do it for six months, there's a milestone, and then after you close the round, you you just cannot give a fuck for a week, right? Uh, and like in our work together with you, also, there hasn't been a time like that yet, I think. Uh, and, and also, the, the other thing about working in startups, and I think that's what, like, like I think, uh, don't quote me again on this, but I think people with ADG uh, tend to start companies three or four times more than the general population. And, and I think part of that is because you just can't fit in. Uh, and when you run your own company and you run your own team, you you kind of drive the tempo, right? And and then you hustle, 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 and then you relax, hustle, 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 relax, right? And then uh, it, it just when you are that person, it makes it so much easier, uh, especially if you're more sensitive than the rest of the team. And yeah, uh, but that that's an area. Time management difficulties is something that plays into this because in Web three, nobody's expected to be on time for anything anyway. Um, yeah, exactly. If you're working without seeing people, there's less energy spent on masking. That's a really good one because you don't need to do it in person, you can text. But I think that's really, really bad for body doubling. Uh, where body doubling is a concept where you can do work when somebody's watching you do it, but unless in somebody you care about is watching you, it becomes impossible to do. So uh, we, we, one of the key recommendations in um, in the UK is um, uh, to get an assistant for certain types of tasks. And that doesn't need to be a full-time thing. That's not a privileged thing, right? It's just uh, never, ever, ever try to do admin without an assistant. It's, it's uh, just the, the log like when I've been absolutely broke and... Um, I would rather not eat than not pay the, pay uh, an assistant. And I like a huge part of my life I had an assistant. Uh, it just because of necessity, right? Uh, and um, 
when I didn't, like that's how I went through school, you trade. So generally, it's better to trade four hours of your time to build somebody's uh, marketing strategy, put 30 minutes of their time to do your um, time recording. Like when, when I had my first job, I was supposed to do time tracking for the work I do as a software engineer. I never did it. I was working for ACP, which is the company that runs all businesses in the world, especially at the time it was great, right? So I was building... I was building the software and NASA astronauts used to do their time tracking, <laughs> but I never did it. And uh, and the way my boss handled is basically he made me in charge of building internal tools that he managed the performance reporting of the whole organization and then present uh, where we went on the roadmap uh, every week. And while I was building this thing and making a presentation, talking to people, I was also inputting my work in the database directly. But I never managed to use the tool, right? And then the problem with Web3 is that when you have things like coordinate and uh, authenticating with your wallet, you can't de uh, delegate this to an assistant for somebody to fill in with you. So this is incredibly discriminatory because you, you, you shouldn't be expected to do that as a normal person. Like that, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, I think Web3, I, I think we'll develop delegation of wallets at some point to, to another user. Like we do with email and that would get solved for tools automatically better than in Web2. But I think at the moment we don't have that yet. So you end up with a situation where you like you need to sign some smart contracts so you can get some bajillion dollar airdrop and then you can't delegate to anybody. So you just don't do it. And the bigger the incentive is, the less likely you're able to do it, which is kind of ironic. Um, loser structures could make folks even more difficult. I don't understand this one. Oh, well, there's some money for innovation and for solving problems. And we can create very, very bespoke working experience and environments exactly because of those. It can le really leverage the super strengths of more different people. And, and let, let's push this movement forward in a way that's pragmatic, constructive. It's not about activism or being right or wrong, but rather it's about making things work. <clears throat> I'll share what, what I meant by that, that just DAOs usually have a looser organization, organizational structure. So someone with ADHD might um, find that disorienting. I mean, if there's if it's not really clear what needs to be done, um, and particularly someone with ADHD who hasn't learned self-management strategies yeah. could find it really disorienting or just like that they're maybe not as efficient as they would be with more clear defined yeah. structure. A hundred percent. Yeah, the, the irony of ADHD is that you both need structure in order to be able to do anything, but you also despise structure that somebody else is creating more than anything, and you're completely unable to create structure. So, so it's quite paradoxical. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm nodding here. So I was like, let me turn on my camera so you can see me <laughs> <laughs> like nodding yeah. along to you. And and yeah, and there's that, yeah, there's the appeal for that looser structure too at the same time and, and the like desire for it while like still needing some structure in order to get things done. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a phenomenon that actually ironically hits uh, people with high IQ a lot more and makes them a lot more damaged because generally if you have high enough IQ, generally up to eighth grade, you never need to study, right? If you have ADHD, that's a lot worse on that ground too. And then you go through high school and university, and at some point, uh, no matter how smart you are, at some point you have to study. But uh, the smarter you are and the more new ADHD you are, the late, because I think ADHD also may, I don't know if it helps you not study in some way, but you become quite good at crisis management and you do the stuff last minute. And at one point you hit the ceiling and you spend your entire life never learning any of the organizational skills to create structure and organized study, for example, right? And then you build these social systems around you to make you function in society, which are very elaborate, but the moment they get disrupted, you can't do something on your own, right? And I think DAOs have this notorious thing when, at least my experience is, once you get plugged in, there are these uh, kind of uh, stimulation mechanisms that get you to have something specific to respond to and then work on it. But until you get plugged in, it's essentially absolutely impossible to, to proactively do the bits that include you, right? It's, it's just absolutely impossible. Uh, and I, I've been interested in this whole space. Like, I, as I said, I, I was a really, I built tech for it in 2015, right? Who knew what a DAO was in 15? And I, I never, I tried and I never managed to get involved in any DAO because it just seemed like I need to read a document and go do something on my own and nobody's really interacting with me and doing anything fun. Yeah, fuck this shit. 
So I, I think from that point of view, you need very specific onboarding experiences. And I'd love to hear, I mean, did you have something to add to that from your personal experience or? Hmm. I mean, I, it actually does get into my own personal experience, especially what you just said, both both educationally and never really having to actually study <laughs> um, for a long time. And then, but then like trying to find my way in DAOs, you know, too, and, and getting plugged in as well as, um, as well, well as trying to find my spot because, and I, I've never been diagnosed with ADHD, so I don't, I, I don't think I have it, but, um, but at the same time, there's the appeal for it and so many different skills that I want to offer that I don't know where to start with mm. what to offer to an open system like that. So it's a challenge, I think, for lots of people. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. also relate to many of the things that I, I, I'm not I have not been diagnosed diagnosed with ADHD and I don't think that I have it but I relate a lot with the problems that you're experiencing with that onboarding in DAOs and I feel like the 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 benefits of DAOs are just felt stronger if you do have ADHD and the negatives as well yeah so, and but like intuitively before I got here I couldn't really think of a positive in DAOs for someone with ADHD because it's just it's it's madness like it's so I mean the DAOs not the ADHD like the 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 whole um I mean DAOs are not particularly organized as of now right like so just getting involved and also dealing with all these inputs seems like really really it is really really difficult for me and I I don't think I engage well in DAOs um but for someone with ADHD, it sounds even worse. And uh, But now you gave me another perspective that for the benefits of DAOs, you actually appreciate them way more probably than what I do. So that's like, that's interesting. And and I think that the onboarding process should be just simplified for all of us. <laughs> no, I think, yeah. yeah. Like we had a chat with Corey from our marketing team in our DAO about how to frame this talk. And I came up with a bunch of key points and she said, yeah, but isn't that true for everybody? And I, yeah. but it, a lot of this is just DAOs in general, like everybody burns out in DAOs and a lot of it is just remote work in general. Uh, it's just DAOs seem to be an extreme case of remote work that's very real time. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they have other differences, but they are already important, right? And I think one of the ones I thought about is for whatever reason, uh, like people, a lot of neurodivergent people, and that tends to be more pronounced with autistic people for some reason, but it's definitely an ADHD thing as well, is you became, you develop this insane uh, justice sensitivity, right? And if you see somebody being treated unjustly, you, just, you, you can't function. And everybody cares about justice, I get it, but there seems to be a pathological problem with justice, especially with, with autistic people. Uh, and uh, and I think in DAOs, uh, you get to have uh, like a lot of voice, even though I think most of the time, for most people, it doesn't matter that you do, but at least you have this sensation that you can participate in decision-making and um, just go somewhere and complain or just without permission as you go and start doing something, right? Which I think is super appealing conception. And then if this field evolves well, then these things can become more real in, in terms of the implications. I think in most DAOs, they don't really work that well. But yeah, I mean, I think that seems to be one appeal um, where, yeah, a lot of us gather around forums where we can address social injustices and then you have a group and then these days can turn into a DAO or something. And they, they might get discovery, I think, actually. That's a really interesting point where they actually not good for neurodivergent people. But it's just newer diversion people tend to get discovered or discovered DAOs uh, more because of the channel thing. I don't know if it's the case, but it's uh, you gave me an idea. Yeah. 